I'm redrawing your characters, half for fun and half because some of the best help I've gotten in my art journey has been from direct feedback from other artists. So our process goes like this. One, we diagnose what things these artists can work on going forward and some principles, fundamentals, and examples of art and design that we can all learn from. Second, we'll look at ways that they might improve their existing design with some drawovers. And then third, I'll see how I'd approach drawing the characters if it was me, if I was doing it, for fun. This is, this is how I have fun. Remember that the vibes we're going for on this channel are all about being positive and proactive. No one's getting their art roasted. Everyone's being met where they are on their artistic journey. Any roasters, you're gonna get yourselves Kenny Rogers. That doesn't even make any sense. First up is at PsychArt5, a longtime patron who has a full cast of characters. And this is their character, Tina, a young and inexperienced yet chipper wolf pup eager to earn her father's respect. So, step number one, diagnosis. Now, character design is always open to being abstracted away from the real life thing that it's based off of, and one needs to look really no further than the Sonic the Hedgehog series for an example. Now, like Sonic characters, Tina's head shape here is spherical, completely round. However, even a character with a round head like Sonic still has a secondary shape to their jaw, no matter how small it is. Sonic characters were initially based on designs like the 30s Mickey Mouse and Felix the Cat, when simple round heads tended to be the norm. But even if a Sonic character's head looks like a circle from a certain perspective, there's still depth to the features, and from the side view, we would see a protrusion of the jaw or muzzle. So for the sake of argument, what would a wolf look like in the Sonic style? Well, we're probably in the right ballpark here with Tina, but we still need something extra for the muzzle. Plus, from a design perspective, Tina ends up looking a little bit more like a cat or lynx, in my opinion. Now, the face aside, I really like this interpretation in this one image of Tina uh, being a little shorter in stature, and I'd love for her clothing to be a little bit more ill-fitting and oversized. Now, not only is that visually appealing, but it's also a really good visual shortcut to show that this character is still trying to grow into something, like a role or their maturity. Now it's time for step number two. I'm gonna change some of these proportions up and apply what we said in step one while pulling the nose and mouth features that are somewhat flatly applied to the face into a muzzle for a dimension. Now if we aren't careful, features like this will look like they're printed on instead of shapes with their own 3D specs. I'm keeping the face the way that it already is, so to me this still looks a bit more like a cat just because canines have a longer nose. We'll address that in step number three. Now, it takes a little bit of work to scrunch these proportions down and still appear like a snout, but I think we landed somewhere pretty good with my own interpretation of the character. Of course, I don't expect the original artists to draw just like me because we're all different, but hopefully this gives them some ideas going forward. Thanks again to at PsychArt5 for loaning us their adorable character Tina here for us to learn from. Time for a quick illustration assessment in between characters. Here, Chad has a painting with a cat underwater encountering this warrior fish on the back of a seahorse. I love this idea. Now, there are some things that could be improved with the values in this painting, especially in the background. If, for instance, we pull all the hues away and we just make this a black and white image, it looks like there's a lot sort of competing for our attention. And something like this would immediately give us a little bit more clarity of where the shapes are and what things are further away from us. For now though, let's focus on the story. It seems like the central story of this image is the conflict between these two characters. One of the most important things to make that apparent is with eye lines. Now, where are these two characters looking? Right now, the cat seems to be looking off the screen, sort of towards us, kind of about there. And the fish is looking off screen, upwards. This painting becomes instantly more compelling when we adjust the position of the head and eyes so that the characters are looking directly at each other. Now, they're deadlocked with direct eye contact. There's immediately some tension. I mean, do you kind of sheepishly look around the room when two of you are reaching for the last slice of pizza? No, that's cause for a stare down. Thanks again, Chad, have fun creating. Next up, we've got Meltdown Astral and their character, Meltdown, a bounty hunter with an alternate form called Infernal. Now to me, this character's name is a double entendre. They're prone to going nuclear, literally, and they've got such strong emotions that they can easily reach a breaking point. So we're back at step number one, diagnosis. This character has really interesting and dynamic proportions, and their presentation style is rather graphic. Think of characters like Hello Kitty and Invader Zim. If, 
if someone tells me this this isn't Hello Kitty, it's like her sister Sunshine Mint Julep or something, I, I wouldn't be surprised. When these characters are drawn, you only need flat graphical shapes to represent them. Think of the vector shapes in Illustrator. It's only once you start to move them in animation that you need to know how they look from different angles and dimensions. In this Hello Kitty anime example, the character is moving and rotating like a fully dimensional character. And in Invader Zim's case, aside from creative camera moves, they're generally being animated like many other series animation with a little bit more limitations from a particular angle like straight on or three quarter view. So we don't need to know as much about how they turn in dimension, just how they move when they're facing this one way. Aside from the graphical character influence and the sort of early 2000s Hot Topic vibe, I also see a little bit of like what could be graffiti influence in this character. You know, you could surround it with sprays and shading and stuff like that, little drips of paint. It's cool. It's a good vibe. For Meltdown Astral, the artist, looking at their other work, there's a fine line between using these bold, thick lines and flat shapes to sell a graphical look, and things like varying line thickness, wonky proportions, and dimensionality that's not quite working to make our characters look stuck between the dimensional look of something like a 2D Disney movie and flat and graphical. I'll be looking for ways to make Meltdown's flat shapes make sense and use color and proportion to make some of the overlapping elements a little bit easier to read. On to step number two. Now remember that as an artist myself, my preference is always to make characters that make sense dimensionally. So I'm trying to set some of that aside so that I'm not needlessly changing things for Meltdown. If it were only down to preference, there are a few Invader Zim designs that are pretty appealing to me subjectively, and then no hate intended, but everything about this character's hair is making the character designer in me short circuit. I get the point, I get what they're going for, but, but I don't have to like it. But why are you booing me? I, I'm wrong. <laughs> Remember that lines are just an abstract way of separating different shapes. And while sharp angles and thick lines are cool stylistically, you can easily go overboard into the line art dominating your character's shapes. It can also look like there's just less resolution to your drawing because there's so little negative space between the lines. I'm essentially drawing over top of Meltdown here and streamlining things like the body, collar, and hands. Plus, I think these boots can be rounded off at the bottom too. I'm interpreting these shapes in the bottom corner of the character's eyes as a kind of welling tear sort of situation, like they're on the verge of a Meltdown. When it comes to using color, we get an awesome radioactive yellow and green, but these dark colors all overlapping makes it hard to tell what's going on in the arms and legs. Making those just a shade lighter and changing the color of the eyes so that you can see the pupils more easily makes it so our color serves the character better. Now, while I like what we did in step two, it's probably my favorite interpretation of the character since very little is fundamentally changed, let's at least see where we can go with step three. What would it look like if I was drawing this character myself? I tried a few little things here and there with this take, if nothing other than to get something new onto the page. Now, here's something cheeky. I tried to make the two eyes and the mouth into the abstract shape of the nuclear waste symbol. It's only vaguely there in the final. I usually feel more comfortable with clean segment breaks like those at the top of the boots instead of trying to overlap shapes like that when we don't need to. I also leaned a bit into the shape motif of nuclear silos, which are a little bit hourglass-like. So I'm pinching the shape of the jacket and letting the front lapels make a triangle instead of a straight cut. And speaking of cuts, just a new, more chopped hairstyle that looks a bit more chaotic. Personally, I still prefer number two, but three was a fun exercise. Thanks again to Meltdown Astral for submitting their character. Character design certainly isn't a one-size-fits-all scenario, and a design is usually only as good as its purpose, which can vary from mascot to comic character to 3D animated character. Still, practice of fundamentals will help you become more and more proficient at making characters that can fit these purposes, even multiple purposes. Remember, these slots are limited, and the best way to get personalized help from me is always going to be through Patreon at the Novice Bard tier. There, after your initial personalized video, you have ongoing mentorship from me, where you can ask questions and submit work for drawovers through Patreon or Discord DMs. Plus, everyone on that level also gets Biko's backpack, a hard enamel pin, and foil trading card in their mailbox every month, essentially for free at that point. This is last month's thing. I didn't get to show in a video. And if you're just starting out or you want some character design education, make sure to check out my comprehensive Learn Character Design course at learncharacterdesign.com. 
Let me know what you thought of this new format. Give a warm round of applause to the folks who are willing to have their work featured in a public video like this. And let me know what you'd like to see next. Thanks so much for watching. Have fun creating. And YouTube thinks you'd like to watch this video next.